Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, today we're pleased to have Alexandra Kola here. Uh, she graduated from UC Berkeley and was at the Institute for Event Study for a year before coming here as a postdoc. She's going to tell us about unique games. Thanks for having me. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the joint result with Kosti and Yuri Makaitev. And uh, since, you know, I already gave a talk about unique games here not too long ago, I decided at least, you know, to change the color from white to blue so it looks different. And um, probably you already heard my introduction previously, so the suspense is all killed now, but let me recap some things about Unigames. Um, Unigames conjecture is something that, conjecture that Subhash Scott made in 2002. And what's interesting about this conjecture is that it has been used since 2002 by many researchers to prove optimal hardness of approximation results. An example is, do we have a pointer here? No. Oh, this is a laser pointer. Yeah. Okay. So an example is um, Cotton and Regev proved that vertex cover is hard to approximate better than two, basically, and two is the best approximation algorithm we know. And Cot, Kindler, Mosen, and O'Donnell, 2004, uh, showed the hardness of 0 0.878 for max cut, which is also the best algorithm, uh, the, the best algorithm that we know by Gammons and Williamson. And then 2008, a breakthrough that Raghavendra had, so that hardness, the hardness of every constraint satisfaction problem um, equals this integrality gap uh, up to some constant epsilon. And there are many other hardness results um, that rely on UGC for max cut vertex cover, as we said, graph coloring, max CSP, quadratic forms, max acyclic sub subgraph, multi-way cut, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Okay, so that's why Unigames conjecture is interesting. But what is the Unigames conjecture? What are Unigames? Um, in Unigames, you're given a graph with n vertices, and you're given k colors. And um, for each edge uh, between two vertices, u and v, you're given a constraint, a permutation pi uv of the colors. And uh, you're required to satisfy as many constraints as possible. So a constraint is satisfied if uh, you give a coloring to u a color to U and a color to V, such that uh, these colors match according to this permutation. For example, for this particular instance, if I was color uh, U with yellow and V with red, then yellow maps to red according to pi UV. So this edge or this constraint is satisfied. So this is done, and then I can you know, ask to give a coloring of the graph as to maximize the number of satisfied constraints. Okay, that should be clear from previous time anyway. What are unique games? Uh, so Cal 2002 conjectured that given an instance of unique games with opt bigger than one minus epsilon, so more than one minus epsilon fraction of the constraints are satisfied, can be satisfied, um, then it is NP hard to satisfy even a delta fraction of all constraints for every positive epsilon and delta in sufficiently large label size or alphabet size K. So even if the game this constraint satisfaction problem is very, very satisfiable. Called conjecture that it's NP hard to even find the sat an assignment that satisfies a half or 0.1 of the constraints. Okay, so that's kind of surprising because we know how to satisfy, uh, if an instance is completely satisfiable, we know how to find a satisfying assignment. Okay, yeah. Just if you go with the permission itself. It's NP hard not for a given. You don't mean for a given instance. No. I mean it's empty hard. There is decide. there is a k, right. an alphabet size k. You give me epsilon delta, I give you k. And an instance with alphabet size k such that. But just a naive reading of what is written up there would. Oh. It's like it's, it's empty hard for a specific instance. Yeah, yeah. The, That's not. The, the given is k. Right. I can see how this can be misread. Yeah, but no, that's yeah. 
the conjecture is that there is a family of these hard yes. instances that can't dissolve, but still holds. I mean, if you, if you have a given instance, we can see that's finite, right? It's not resolved in constant time. I don't know if you believe that's what you mean. Um, okay, so the nice thing about this conjecture is not only that it was so helpful in proving optimal hardness of approximation results, is that there has been really the last 10 years, even though people in theory have really thought about it hard and you know, worked on it for like really intensely, there has been no consensus really. Um, it's not clear if, it's about 50-50 who believes it's true and who believes it's not true. Um, so, in fact, there have been efforts in both proving and disproving it. And um, let's see what's known. So a question, you know, immediate question one can ask is do existing, you know, state-of-the-art methods work for unit games? Uh, in fact, Kot and Vishnoi, 2004, proved that semi-definite programming cannot disprove the unit games conjecture. Uh, they presented an STP integrality gap, the Kot Vishnoi instance, as it's called, um, that uh, STP fails when run on this instance. And um, for other stronger semi-definite or linear programming relaxations and hierarchies, there have been other results of this type uh, that these hierarchies cannot be used to disprove unit games conjecture uh, by Tsaikar Makaritsev Makaritsev, Kot Sackett, and Raghavendra Starer. And um, so what do we know? Well, we, we do know some things. There have been some approximation algorithms uh, around, even from the same paper that Kot conjectured, made the conjecture. So Kot has app approximation algorithms, Trevisan, Gupta, Talwar, and Chaikar Makaritsev Makaritsev. And uh, we're going to stay here for a second and uh, note that Kot Kindler, Mosen, and Aldona showed that this algorithm um, is tight, assuming the Unigames conjecture. So this algorithm, given a 1 minus epsilon satisfiable instance of Unigames, can satisfy 1 minus square root epsilon log alphabet size of the constraints, and that's tight. You cannot improve that unless you disprove UGC. And uh, in another line of work, there has been uh, investigation of what happens, what are special families that maybe in the games is easy. And uh, um, with Tulsiani, and then with Aurora Code, Star, Tulsiani, and Visnoi, we had the result that says expander graphs, Unigame series, and expanders. And uh, Makarich has improved that um, for delta, taking into account the edge expansion instead of the second eigenvalue. And then also Kot Visnoi instance is easy by a recent result of mine. And parallel repetition, Barak Hart, Aviv, Rao, Regev, and Starer. So that games that come from parallel repetition are easy. And um, sub exponential algorithms exist for unit games, as um, seen by a late, re late result by Aurora, Barak, and Starer. Um, so that's, that's all in the algorithm side. Has been a lot of. Uh, attempts to disprove UGC. Now on the hardness side, there has also been some conjectures, um, stronger conjectures, uh, small set expansion conjecture by Ragavendra, Starry, Tetali, and Tulsiani, and weaker conjectures, the linear equations over the reals by Colin Moskowitz. Uh, but all these conjectures imply or are implied by Unigames conjecture. And uh, there has been no work, as far as I know, uh, finished at least. If there are quantum algorithms for unique games, um, so that's the, the picture. Yeah. So what is the code So the three equations over the reals, approximately certain equations over the reals with three variables is UGC hard. Um, okay, so now we saw expanders are easy, cut is easy, Prior repetition is easy. In fact, we don't know how hard instances of Unigames would look like. And uh, unlike other problems, we believe that um, random instances of SAT are NP hard, according to Figus conjecture. Factor PQ for random P, approximately same order of Q, is hard. Finding planted flicks um, is NP hard, roughly <laughs> for less than square root n, the n to the one half minus epsilon planted flicks. I don't know. Another one where I think people disagree. All right. <laughs> well, let me, you know, just put more things on my list <laughs> for now. <laughs> and then I'll be happy to be wrong. Uh, okay, so, but we really don't know what happens 
when it comes. No, I'm sorry, you said the end. Yeah, I, I missed. So the first two, you're talking about random, and, and the third, when you say it's NP hard, you mean that maybe I miss. We know that finding. If a planted click is less than root n, no, but this you is, can find that's, better that's than. That's about the random. You're talking about the random case. Yeah. Because you said NP hard. Okay. The word random is not in the third in the flat line. That's ah, okay. okay. <laughs> um. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. So, so then so believe that... We know it's NP hard for a general graph. Yes, because for random graphs though. Do you still believe... For random graphs, there's... There's no consensus there's either. There's no consensus. Well, I, I put it in the, the leave yeah. is hard case for now, and then we'll see. Um, okay, so a natural question to ask then, you know, let's try to construct these hard distributions for unit games. Uh, well, we already know that completely random graphs with random constraints are easy that, because random graphs are expanders. So that's not very interesting anymore. Uh, but we can ask our semi-random unit games instances easy. And uh, what does that mean? So our model is as follows. For now, let's, let's consider the general case of unit games, the adversarial model. How to construct 1 minus epsilon satisfiable instances in general, in the worst case. So we, we choose a constraint graph we choose a completely satisfiable set of constraints. And we pick an epsilon fraction of all edges, let's say epsilon prime, and replace every constraint in epsilon prime with another constraint, which is now not satisfied anymore, possibly. And if all steps are adversarial, then we get the general worst case, one minus epsilon satisfiable instance of unique games. Um, so our model, the semi-random model, is one of the steps is random, either the graph choice is random, or the set of satisfiable constraints is random, or the epsilon fra fraction of edges you pick is random, or the constraints you choose to replace with this epsilon fraction of edges is random, and all the other steps are adversarial. Then, what we show is that if the average degree of a graph is large enough, roughly le greater than log the alphabet size, um, then a semi-random unique game is easy. There is a polynomial time algorithm that with high probability works and finds a, you know, a half or some good assignment. And in fact, this holds for all four models, so any of the steps is right. I mean, okay, the first step was already known for the expanders, but the other three cases. And falls for general unit games and the special case when equations are linear unit games. Um, in this talk, I'm going to just give the third step being random. So, so, so like four well, the first proof was already done in the expander case. And it's three different proofs, yes. You could have built up the suspense more by saying, what? Two of them are random, but two of them are random. <laughs> 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 you can prove the strongest. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I figured this talk would be more straightforward because last talk it was building suspense. So yeah. um, but anyway, so let's, let's just uh, see how this case works. So now graph is any graph. Uh, we start from any completely satisfiable set of constraints. So nature picks epsilon fraction of edges at random, and then adversary replace the constraints on these edges with some other constraints as the adversary wishes. So, so, so give question in the adversary, the adversary at step two, for instance, can't see what the randomness is going to be at step three. Actually, so, so. All steps are sequential. Um, and we call these random edges adversarial constraints. Just all right, so uh, in order to analyze this case and see how the um, algorithm would work, let's look at the standard semi-definite program that has been used many times uh, for unit games. So what is this semi-definite program? Well, let's, um, let's see how we would rewrite um, this optimization problem as a quadratic or vector program. So we introduce an indicator vector ui for its vertex u and its color i. This is a flag. So in the intended solution, an actual labeling, uh, one of the UIs would be some unit vector, and all the rest are zero. And if you know, we wanted to assign label i to vertex u, then you know, u sub i for this color would be the non-zero vector, and all the others are zero. The number of satisfied constraints equal this expression, which is a half summation over all edges, summation over all i's, uh, square norm of ui minus v 
P U V of I squared, yeah. Uh, is that clear why this solves, I mean, if we could solve this problem, then we could solve the unique games problem? So which problem? To find a solution like that, that minimizes this quantity. So shouldn't E depend on I? No. You can think of it as one or zero. It doesn't have to even, I mean, it can be one, one dimensional, if it's actually a solution. You mean that E, right? right? Yeah. But, but in general, E is going to have to be what? No, I mean, I haven't said anything. I'm just saying, if for some reason we could solve, we can find a solution that looks like that. For every vertex, we have a flag with its one in one label and zero otherwise, and minimize this quantity, then this is a quadratic program, basically, that solves unigames, which is NP hard to do. V? V? U V is an edge. V sub permutation of I is the flag for the label. And so if you, if you look at a particular edge and a particular label that says, so there, there are like the cases that both of them are zero, both of them are one, one of them is zero, and one of them is one. If both of them are one, it means that the constraint is satisfied because I gave the correct label I was sent to pi U V of I. If both of them are zero, nothing happens. This is zero. And if one of them is one and the other is zero, it means the constraint is unsatisfied. So this counts the number of unsatisfied constraints. But, but everything you're saying at the moment, E is just equal to what? Little H? Yes. Yeah. So that's what you mean when you say, if you solve this problem, you solve it. For yeah. one in particular, yes. I'm, I'm introducing but vector notation for later, but yes. But it's not true that if you could solve this for um, vector yeah, you can think of it as one for now. Yes, that's enough. Okay? I just wanted to, to make sure that you're convinced that this counts the number of unsatisfied constraints. It's very simple what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Okay. Um, cool. So now we can relax this uh, one zero condition and we can you know, write an actual semi definite, positive semi definite constraint. So instead of one of them being one and the rest are zero, now the sum of the square norms of these vectors is one. So you can think of it as a probability distribution or you know, something else. <laughs> and uh, these vectors are orthogonal, and we also impose triangle inequalities. This is some technical condition that I'm not going like, to uh, deal with right now. Um, so this is semi-definite programming standard relaxation that has been used many times, and we can solve this program efficiently. And um, this program outputs a vector solution. So for each vertex and for its color, there is a vector. All these vectors are orthogonal. They possibly have different lengths. Some of them might be zero, and some of them, you know. And um, you know, that's how a semi -def this solution to the semi-definite program looks like. So let's see if, if we route this semi-definite program and try to solve it for a semi-random instance what happens where there is a problem because this technique fails. And why does it fail? A, a, re a way to easily see why it fails is um, the before mentioned Kalkvisnoi instance, which is the instance that is an integrality gap problematic for the standard semi-definite program. And uh, this instance, all you have to know is that the value of the semi-definite program of this minimization quantity is, say, epsilon over 10. However, the integral value is very large. Almost all constraints are unsatisfied. They cannot be satisfied. So it's a really highly unsatisfiable instance where the STP thinks it's really highly satisfiable. And um, some random instances might contain hidden Kotvisnoid sub-instances as follows. So let's assume that this is the Kotvisnoid graph and alphabet size is k. And here are the Kotvisnoid constraints. And uh, we can also think of a different completely satisfiable instance on the same graph on alphabet size k and superimpose these two instances together so that now our alphabet size is 2k and here's like a Kotvisnoi layer and a completely satisfiable layer. So we just sort of lift, we create a new instance by combining both and just having the original Kotvisnoi permutations in the first k label say and different permutations in the next k labels. And now we randomly pick epsilon fraction of the edges 
And since the adversary has a choice to change these uh, permutations on these edges, what the adversary does, he can pick a completely satisfiable layer and only change that, which would make the STP answer the same basically as the cutwish noise. So the STP would concentrate all its weight of the vectors in the first k labels, since the value of the solution is epsilon over 10, which is less than epsilon. Is it clear why this is a problem? Yes? You look a little confused. So the edges remain the same number of edges. We just double the alphabet size. And we consider, sorry, a, a direct sum. Oh, epsilon fraction. But by adversarial, you mean for all, right? For all ways of changing the constraints, you still want to be able to solve. So there are yeah, so I'm giving you a way to change the constraints but that this STP could not do anything. But what you want is for all ways. No, but this is a counterexample. It's enough to give one to show that this doesn't work. I'm, I'm just saying that the I STP think, doesn't work. It cannot. I see you're saying the STP doesn't work. Because here is an example that, in fact, the STP value has nothing to do, has no information about the actual solution, because the actual solution would assign labels to the satisfiable layer, so the, this K labels. But the actual value of this objective function is less, is, is bigger than what's for the kotwish noy STP solution. So the STP would concentrate all its norm of the vectors it outputs in the kotwish noy layer. Okay, so this is a problem. And um, what we do to solve that problem is we introduce a different um, STP, which we call crude STP. And uh, instead of having this summation of all these things to be one, and now we require that all these vectors that um, it's an output to a specific vertex have norm one. So all the vectors are unit vectors. And again, they're orthogonal and triangular qualities. And this which, which are, which are is vi minus uj squared plus. You mean how do I write it? Or? The yeah. square triangle, L2 squared. Into squared of all of Wait, typically, that's what happens in the standard STP. We only need uh, for you know two vectors of the same, say vertex ui and uj, and all the vectors of the other vertices. But yeah, L to squared for yeah. Okay, so this is not a relaxation. In fact, even if the unit game instance is completely uh, very satisfiable, then this might have big value. It's, it really, the value of that doesn't say anything about unit games. Doesn't have any meaning. Um, so let's see why we would want to introduce that. Uh, to see why, let's, uh, let's first take a step and define the label extended graph, which would be useful. So the label extended graph is just um, a graph sort of lifted up by k. So for its original vertex of the graph, you now introduce k vertexes, each one vertex for its label. And uh, there is an edge uh, between this, this blurb of k vertices and this blurb of k vertices. There is a matching that corresponds to the constraint or the permutation that was there. Um, so what, what this all means is that now I have n times k vertices. And an edge is between ui and vj. Um, if there was an edge between u and v in the original graph, and i equals pi uv of j. So that's how the label extended graph would look like. This is just rearranging for my pictures to look better. OK. So we, we have a definition. A, an edge of the label extended graph now can be seen um, together with this STP as having assigned to it two vectors. So edge u, comma i, v, comma j has two vectors assigned, ui and vj. And we call this edge super short if um, ui minus vj squared is less than some constant over log k. 
So if really those two vectors that the STP outputs are very close. So this definition is tied to a specific STP solution. Is that clear what super sort edge is? Okay. So here would be a super sort edge, here would be a super sort edge because these two vectors have very small um, square, square num di difference. And this is a set of super sort edges in my level extended graph. Okay, why do I care about that? Well, the nice thing that we can show is that if uh, X sub U was a satisfying solution to the original instance, the non-corrupted instance, the completely satisfiable instance, then one minus some epsilon prime, uh, which is depending on epsilon, fraction of edges U comma X U and V comma X V in the label extended graph are super short. So there are very many super short edges in the satisfiable layer, basically. That's what our structural theorem says. And um, let's see why would we care about having a lot of super short edges in the satisfiable layer. For that, let's step back and look at how a typical popular charikar makarichev makarichev type semi-definite programming roundings for unique games go. So we had here uh, STP solution, there are K orthogonal vectors for each vertex. And um, basically what we do is we interpret this semi-definite programming solution as a probability distribution uh, of assignments of values to variables. And we want to pick an assignment to variables by sampling from this distribution such that variables connected by constraints are, are strongly correlated. And what does that mean is that uh, we pick a random Gaussian vector and we examine the projections of all these vectors onto this random Gaussian vector and pick the one that has basically the largest projection. We we'll modify this to you know, more um, delicate analysis to take all these original different uh, lengths of the vectors into account, etc. But the main idea is Gaussian projections like that. So that's what CMM does. And uh, if we go back to the super short edges and the label extended graph, we can see that here was the STP solution on a super short edge. Well, what's nice about it is that this, these two vectors are so close that CMM-like STP rounding algorithms would not cut that edge. So if you pick a rounding Gaussian vector, the projections of both of those vectors on it would be very close to each other. So it would be likely if we picked this one as being the largest projection, we would also pick the other one. So that's good news. Since there are many super short edges, um, it's unlikely that super short edges is cut, are, are cut by STP rounding algorithms. But there are bad news too, because this is a crude STP, it's not a relaxation, and has no information um, necessary to actually run these rounding algorithms. All vertices have the same probability to be chosen, have the same length. We had unit vectors, so there is no clear way how to extract the actual information out of this STP. Okay, so what do we do to remedy that? Well, what we do is we, together with this STP, we write an LP to sort of recover the lengths of those vectors to find the probabilities that the vertex level, label pair belongs to the solution. So RLP just maximizes over all super short edges uh, the mean of pi ui, p ui, and p vj. And we require that the sum of, for each vertex, the sum of those p uis is one. And this might be a little confusing, but all it does, uh, you can think of the PUIs as the lost lengths of this STP solution. And then we round the STP and LP together using techniques developed in the Charikar Makarichev Makarichev algorithm. Okay. Um, and let's see a little bit, say a few words about our structural theorem. Uh, so as we remember, we had, if XU is a completely satisfy, satisfying solution of the original instance before the corruption happened, then 
some large fraction of edges in the label extended graph would be super short. So that's a structural theorem. And the way to show that, I'm not going to get into the proof because it's mostly technical, but the idea is that if this doesn't happen, what? <laughs> I can tell you the proof on the board, it's really difficult. <laughs> Um, so if this doesn't happen, then we combine the STP solution with an integer solution, and we show that this new combined solution has a better value with high probability. So in fact, roughly what we do is uh, every fixed STP with few super short edges can be improved if the, with high probability if the degree of the graph is greater than log k, and then we take a union bound over possible STP solutions. Uh, so the two main ingredients to to show this is a strong concentration bound on the probability and also need to bound the number of STP solutions by clever use of Johnson and Strauss uh, projections and taking epsilon nets. This part? No, this part. So we basically say there is a randomized embedding that for say all what, but one over k fraction, so fix um, an STP solution. We project that down to say log k dimensions, and such that all but one over k fraction of the vectors have some new distance that is roughly close to the old distance. And then we say, okay, that's what we do for each STP solution. And there's like n e to the n times log k. <coughs> many possible ways to take STP solutions. Basically. Yeah. OK. One thing you still don't send me the slide is you say constant dimensional. Well, we think of okay. K, K yeah. Constant. I mean, that's the, in the conjecture case, some constant. Right. So you have how many points in high dimensional space are you projecting? Because if I want, I'm going to approximate. You don't want to approximate all the points, just yeah, just all but one over k, say fraction of them. Actually, one over log k fraction of them. All but one over log k fraction of them is enough. Because basically, we're what we want to do is we would like to have the only task to run CMM, Tyker Makarita of Makarita, which says, OK, if uh, only one over log k fraction is corrupted, then we can recover you know, constant solution. So we always forget about this one over log k easily. Yeah. OK, so what, what we showed is that if the average degree of the graph is greater than log k, then semi-random unit games with some relatively small epsilon are easy. So for an epsilon up to one third, we can show. Um, in fact, we can show that assuming a two to one conjecture, which is something like the Unigames conjecture, a little different, um, then if we take epsilon to be a little bigger, greater than one half, then this is NP hard. So it's basically really, I mean, it's not tight, but sort of we hope a half is the correct value. We didn't really try that much to improve that. But uh, this is interesting to see that. I mean, you can think of it as being UGC hard. Um, and for the other models, our proofs are much different. And I'm not going to get into them. But basically, what we do is we don't care about short edges in the label extent graph any anymore. We care about long edges. and we remove those and solve the STP twice, the standard STP this time. And we have a much more complex probabilistic analysis for these cases. And I'm pretty much done. Uh, so we introduced the semi random models of Unigames. We showed that these models are easy. And you, know, you can read the paper if you want. <laughs> um, and the question now is, can we use these techniques for other semi random type of um, models for combinator other optimization problems. This is interesting to see if you know this is not Unigame specific. Just keep working on Unigames. <laughs>
So this was the easy bubble that you showed us. This was the easy one. <laughs> so let's get to this. Yeah. <laughs> there a question? I think I completely lost all of you. <laughs>